Okay, class, uh, we'll get started. Uh, we were discussing in the previous lecture, we were talking about gradient descent method, and prior to that, we had talked about necessary and sufficient conditions for optimality. Uh, necessary conditions allow us to provide a certification of whether or not a point, not whether or not, if a point is not optimal, that's what necessary conditions allow us to, to, to say. Whereas sufficient conditions allow us to say that if these conditions are satisfied, then this point is optimal. It's globally, um, I mean, it's locally optimal or in the case of convex function, it's globally optimal. Now, uh, in the gradient descent method, our goal is to get to that optimal point or a candidate optimal point. So the setting is, I want to minimize a function of x where x is an Rn. And throughout the discussion for today's class, you should think of the following things in the back of your mind. So I could have x in R2 on a microcontroller. I could have x in R10 on a Raspberry Pi. So that's a more complicated version of a microcontroller or an FPGA. And then I could have x in, I don't know, some one million on a supercomputer. <clears throat> okay? So I want to minimize this function, and yesterday we talked about gradient descent method. Which is written as xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha k dk gradient of fxk. Here alpha k greater than 0 is called step size, dk greater than 0, but, well I'm writing it greater than 0, but what I mean is it's a positive definite matrix is a positive definite matrix. Of course, the gradient of fxk is something that we are all familiar with. Let me show you through a picture how the gradient descent works. So this is my point x star, this is the optimal point, and I'm drawing the contour diagram of the function. So here f is equal to one, here f is equal to two, here f equals to three. So the function value along these contours is the same value. So pick any point x here, the fx is equal to 1, fx is equal to 1, fx equal to 2, fx equal to 3, and so on. So this is my contour of a non-convex function. It's a contour map of a non-convex function in a two-dimensional plane. Okay. I'm standing, so I pick my initial condition randomly. Okay, so I pick this one, well, maybe I shouldn't pick here. Maybe I should pick here. For some reason, I picked this to be my initial condition, x naught, okay? So in this particular case, my first derivative of the function is going to point in this direction. So the first derivative is always normal to this contour plot, 
and it's pointing towards the side where the function value is getting larger and larger. So if I go in this direction, the value of the function is getting smaller. So the gradient of the function must be pointing outwards. So this is my gradient of f at x0. Okay. So the length is the magnitude of the gradient and this is the direction of the gradient. Okay. So I'm standing at x0 and I'm looking at gradient of fx0. Now, what is negative of gradient of fx0? So that's just the same vector with the same magnitude but it's pointing in the opposite direction. This is minus gradient of fx0. Okay. All right, so now Remember, in this particular expression, I'm multiplying the gradient of f with a positive definite matrix dk. What does matrix multiplication to a vector mean in uh, Rn? What happens when you multiply a vector with a matrix in n-dimensional space? It's an affine transformation. What else? Like, how does it look geometrically? Like if, if I plot it, what does it mean? Rotation. rotation, right? It's rotation and scaling. So when I multiply a vector by a matrix, it means that I'm rotating the vector and I'm scaling the vector. Okay? So in this case, I'm multiplying it by a positive definite matrix. It means that I'm rotating the vector by an angle of less than 90 degrees. And I'm, of course, scaling the vector. Okay, so positive definite only means that you are rotating it. You can't really rotate it, you know, all the way to 180 degrees. You can only rotate it up to 90 degrees. So now I'm going to rotate this vector and scale this vector. So now this is my minus d minus d zero gradient of f x zero. So this is minus gradient of fx0. I rotated it and I scaled it and I get minus d0 gradient of fx0. Okay. Now I have this alpha k which is a positive step size. And what that means is I'm going to go, I'm sitting at x0, I'm going to go in this direction uh, for a step with a step size alpha k and let's say this is my x1 here this is my x1 which is equal to x0 minus alpha0 d0 gradient of fx0 so that's this point And I'm going to continue this process again and again, okay? I'll look at the gradient. I will look at the negative gradient. I'll rotate it by an acute angle. I'll take a step. So this would be my x2. This would be my x3. This would be my x4, x5, and so on. Okay, that's the gradient descent algorithm that we are talking about here. And hopefully, it explains to you how we are converging, starting from some initial condition x0, how we are converging to the optimal point x star. Any question with this picture? Okay, this is the geometric picture of what's happening in the gradient descent method. I'm looking at the gradient, multiplying it by an acute angle, and then subtracting it from xk. Yes? 
Sorry? DU is same throughout the process or like do we change it also? Uh, so D, how do you change D? Yeah. We'll talk about it in a bit. Okay, that's the next topic. How do you pick alpha K and DK? Any other question? So now the goal for our uh, discussion today in this class is to understand how to pick this alpha K and how to pick the DK. Okay, that's what we are going to talk about until the end of the class. One thing to note here is the following. So remember how I multiplied it by D naught and somehow this vector moved in the direction of the optimal point. I might have as well chosen my D naught such that this is what my D naught gradient of fx naught looks like. And in that situation, I would have derailed my optimization problem, right? I'm not really going towards the optimal solution. I'm actually going away from the optimal solution. So the choice of D naught matters, okay? It can't be really any D naught that you, that you could think of. Okay, so we need to figure out what D naught, what D naught, D1, D2, all these positive definite matrices look like. In particular, we want these matrices to be picked in a manner that pulls us towards the optimal point, not pushes us away from the optimal point. So that's the first thing we need to keep in mind. The second thing we need to keep in mind is this alpha naught. So here I picked the value of alpha naught that was small. Let's say I picked the value of alpha naught which is very large, okay? This would have been my x2, sorry, x1, which is x0 minus very large alpha naught d0 gradient of fx0. Okay, in which case, again, we are sort of overshooting the optimal point and we are going far away from the optimal point. So we want our step size to be also picked appropriately so that we are getting, we are making progress towards the optimal solution and not just going like overstepping. So I want to reach the table and I start walking so fast that instead of standing at the table, I basically overshoot shoot the, the, the path. So we don't want to do that. So how do we pick alpha K and DK? Okay, so it's an important, important problem to study. Many a times when you're running optimization algorithm, and this will be in your, in your assignment too, uh, I'm going to ask you to pick a large step size and see what happens. You will eventually escape to infinity if you're taking larger and larger step size because you are just not getting close to the optimal solution. You are just doing a zigzag motion with very large magnitude and escape to infinity eventually. So we don't want to do that. So let's see how to pick the two um, livers that we have here, which is alpha K and DK. Okay, any question? Yes. In the previous class, we studied that without the DK, this equation is a unitary uh, gradient descent matrix. Right. So how can DK can change the direction? I mean, this, without the DK, I'm still going towards the optimal point. Right, so you are still going towards the optimal point, but with DK, you can get to the optimal point much faster. You know? So how many iterations you take to get to the optimal solution is an important parameter. If it takes you a million steps, it's bad. If it takes you 10 steps, it's good, right? Okay, so let's talk about how to pick DK. I mean, it's not about how to pick DK, but various possibilities that you have in picking DK. So the first method is steepest descent, where DK equals to identity matrix.
So this was the first method we talked about uh, in the previous class, when DK is identity matrix. The second one is a famous Newton's method where DK is second derivative of the function at XK inverse. What's the dimension of second derivative of f? What's the mat what does that matrix look like? N by n. n by n. So let's say n is equal to 2. It's a two-dimensional vector. This is a 2 cross 2 matrix inverse. Am I able to invert a 2 cross 2 matrix on a FPGA or on a microcontroller? Seems doable, right? You can do it. Now let's assume n is 10 cross 10 matrix. Can I invert a 10 cross 10 matrix on a Raspberry Pi? Yes. Yes. Seems doable. OK. How about a 10 cross 10 inverse on a microcontroller or an FPGA? OK, it seems like a stretch. OK, we probably will not be able to do it. How about a million cross a million dimensional second derivative inverse? So now, the problem is, I have to compute the second derivative. So I have to compute each, in this large matrix, I have to compute every point in that matrix by evaluating the second derivative at a million dimensional vector. Now I have a million cross a million matrix. It's a symmetric matrix, and I have to invert it. Is it possible to do it on a supercomputer? Yes? <laughs> Nobody wants to do that on a supercomputer. OK, so inverting a large matrix is very complicated even on a supercomputer. OK, you don't want to execute that kind of, uh, you don't want to spend time on a supercomputer to compute the second derivative and then invert the matrix. Um, you might just spend $200 worth of electricity in order to do that. OK, it's too expensive. Too expensive, too time consuming, too much data to be passed around, may not be worth the effort. Okay, certainly we cannot do it on a microcontroller or, or on an FPGA or, or a Raspberry Pi. It's just impossible. Okay, so Newton's method is impossible. What else can we do? Diagonally scale steepest descent. Okay, so in diagonally scaled steepest descent, what you try to do is instead of computing the entire second derivative, you just compute the second derivative along the diagonal. So now you only have to compute n der second derivatives, not n square second derivatives. So this seems uh, somewhat manageable. How do you invert a diagonal matrix? Right? So is inverting a diagonal matrix very expensive? No. 
Not really, right? You just have to invert the individual entries along the diagonal. The only thing you need to keep in mind is that all of these diagonal entries must be greater than zero. So if some term turns out to be less than zero, you want to just replace it with one or something, some, something that's larger than zero. Okay, so that way you have DK, which is a positive definite matrix. So diagonally scaled steepest descent is better than steepest descent, but not as good as Newton's method. So it's some, somewhat of a compromise between the two methods. Okay. The fourth one, modified Newton's method, where DK the second derivative of f at x naught inverse. When is modified Newton's method useful? What is it trying to imitate? Well, it's trying to imitate the Newton's method. But in Newton's method, I have to compute the derivative at every point of time and then invert it. Here, I just compute it once, store it in the memory, and keep reusing the same second derivative inverse. <coughs> so here, you have to compute the second derivative, and then you have to invert the matrix. Here. You compute it once, you invert the matrix once, and that's it. You just store it in the memory and continue to use it throughout the lifetime. When is the modified Newton's method useful? Well, when the second derivative of the function doesn't really change over the entire parameter range. Okay? So if you have a quadratic function, of course, the second derivative is, is the same everywhere. So if you have a nearly quadratic function, the second derivative will not really change that much if you go from one point to another. So that's when modified Newton's method is useful. So the fifth one is discretized Newton's method, where you use some past information and experience to come up with an approximation of the second derivative at every point xk, and then you take the inverse of that matrix in order to compute dk. And we'll study an example of this, this method called BFGS method and DFP method. Yes? I have a question. Uh, sure. So this del square f of xk would be invertible when xk satisfies the subject condition, right? Only then it would be a positive definite matrix as well as positive definite matrix as well as positive definite matrix as well as positive Right, but sufficient condition also requires the first derivative to be zero. Yeah. Yeah. So this is only requiring the curvature information doesn't require the information that you are at the optimal point or not. You may not be at the optimal point, but your curvature may still be positive. It so, be sorry? So let's look at this function, right? It's a quadratic function. And I'm standing here. This is my xk. The second derivative is still 
positive definite and invertible, but it's not the optimal point. So it has nothing to do with sufficient condition. But you are right that in some cases, the second derivative may not be a positive definite, in which case we will talk about how to get, how to compute dk. Okay? So that's the situation where you are standing here, this is your xk, and if you look at the second derivative, it might have a couple of negative eigenvalues. So it's not really positive definite. So, so then how do you deal with that situation? We'll talk about it in a bit. Okay. There's another method, Gauss-Newton method, but we'll talk about it in details in one of the classes, so I'm going to skip that. So these are gen general methods for computing dk and for some specific edge cases we will then talk about when we discuss those edge cases we'll talk about how to pick dk okay any question so far why is it that the inverse of the second derivative will always point it towards the optimal and not away from yeah we'll talk about it in a bit yeah any other question? So the question was, why are we focusing so much on second derivative inverse? Why, why would it help us? So the, the short answer is, this method is slow, this method is very fast. And the long answer is, we'll get to it in a bit. Okay? We'll talk about why we are focusing so much on Newton's method. Um, Okay, how about we do it now, okay? Why should we wait for future when we can do it right now? So, okay, let's, let's talk about it. So, in steepest descent, this is what I'm trying to take. This is the step that I'm trying to take. Here is a way to think about steepest descent. Another way to think about steepest descent. Uh, we have talked about it in the previous class. Let's try to think about it in a different manner. So I have a function f of xk plus d. And I want to find the direction d such that this function is minimized. Right? That's the problem that we are facing at every point of time. But this function is very complicated. I don't know how to get, the, get to the minimum of this function. So I'm going to take a first order approximation of this function because I know that they are sort of approximation for small values of d. So I have fxk plus gradient of fxk transpose d. OK, that's the first order approximation of the function. And I want to minimize this thing for d small. Norm of d is small. Okay? I don't want to take a very large step. Because I know, why won't I want to take a large step? Because I know that this approximation is not valid for large values of d. This approximation is only valid for small values of d. So I want d to be small. What do you think the optimal value of d should be in this case? What would d star be? It's minus alpha k gradient of fxk for an appropriately scaled alpha k. This alpha k is needed to make sure that your norm of d is small. Okay? And this leads us to the, to the steepest descent method. Okay, does that make sense? So I want to find a d with small magnitude such that I can minimize this fxk plus d 
This is a complicated expression, so I take the first order Taylor series expansion, and this is an approximation. And then I do the minimization of this first order Taylor series expansion, and I find that, well, d star has to be negative of gradient fxk multiplied by some scalar alpha k to scale it so that the magnitude of d is small. Okay? And if I substitute that d star here, I get xk plus d star, or in other words, xk minus alpha gradient of fxk. Oh, alpha k, sorry. Alpha k here. Now, this gives you a template. I use the first order approximation, but nobody is stopping me from using second order approximation. Okay? So let's use second order approximation. I have the same optimization. I want to minimize f of xk plus d, where the magnitude of d is small. But instead of looking at the first order approximation, I'm going to use the second order approximation. And then I want to minimize this function for where, where the value of d is small. This, assuming the second derivative of f is positive definite matrix, it's actually a convex problem. OK? This is a convex objective function in D. Convex in D. And because it's convex in D, I know from the theorem, sufficient condition, that if a function is convex and we want to minimize it, then I just have to take the first derivative and set it equal to 0, and I get the optimal solution. So the first derivative with respect to d is this is my first derivative. OK? So in particular, this implies d star equals to minus second derivative at xk inverse gradient fxk. So that's the d star, that's the optimal direction in which you should take a step. And now I'm going to just uh, scale well, not alpha k d k, but Where dk is, this is my dk. OK, and that's how we get to the Newton's method. So in Newton's method, we are trying to figure out a direction which is optimal for minimizing the second order Taylor expansion of the function at xk. Now, once you know steepest descent and once you know Newton's method, you can understand that Newton's method appears to be more accurate because you're taking second order Taylor expansion. The approximation is much better. And because the approximation is much better, Newton's method is going to be much faster to get to the optimal solution. And that is indeed the case. Newton's method converges to the optimal solution extremely fast. Uh, by an appropriate choice of step size. Any other question? Okay. Uh, now our goal is to identify methods for picking alpha k. How do we pick alpha k? Let's think about it for a bit. So 
based on the discussion so far, you have agreed that our alpha k should not be too large. If we pick very large step size, we might just overshoot the optimal point, and either we will oscillate or we'll skip to infinity. Okay, so we have to pick small values of alpha k, we so that we don't over overshoot. We don't overshoot, we make progress towards getting to the optimal solution. Now let's say you are lazy, okay? We are all lazy at some points of time during the day. What's the simplest alpha k, small values of alpha k we can think of so that we can run our code and, and call it a day? Just go back to sleep and wake up and the problem is solved. So how, how should we pick our alpha k? What would you do? You're very tired, it's end of the day, you just want the code to run and you want to pick an alpha k and go to sleep. Uh huh. So you want alpha k to be equal to one? The full step that it takes. So alpha k del f of x k should be equal to one. So then make it one by. So two. okay. So you want to pick alpha k to be one over yeah. norm of f x k. Yeah. So as you are converging to the optimal solution, your gradient will vanish, and your alpha k will go to infinity which is a large step size which you don't want to take. Okay, so, so I guess this is a bad strategy. Okay, what else? Yes? Would you pick a bit small number? A small? A small number. Just a small number, good. So it's a small constant. So small is very relative, okay? So some, some optimization, you can pick alpha k to be 0 0.1. In some examples, you will take alpha k to be 0 0.001. And you fix the step size, it's called constant step size. Constant step size algorithm. So you'll pick alpha k to be a constant step size, a small number, 10 raised to minus two, 10 raised to minus three, whatever works, and then you will go to sleep and you let your optimization run and you will wake up in the morning and the problem is solved. Okay, so that's a constant step size algorithm. The second way of picking alpha k is minimization rule. So alpha k is argmin alpha greater than equal to zero. So dk is the descent direction. It could be negative of gradient fxk, it could be negative second derivative inverse fxk. So you can pick dk in different ways. And you solve this minimization problem and you get the value of alpha k by solving this minimization problem. Of course, the hope is that solving this minimization problem should be an easier problem to solve. Uh, in comparison to solving the original optimization problem. Third one is limited minimization. Where alpha k is argmin alpha in zero comma s. So instead of looking at the entire positive real axis, you're just looking at a specific subset, a specific interval of the real axis, positive real axis.
So in these two problems, when you are trying to solve this minimization problem with respect to alpha, you again have to do some gradient evaluations and function evaluations. <clears throat> if you are using bisection method, you have to do a lot of function evaluation for solving this minimization. Or if you are solving it using gradient descent for alpha, then you are again using some, computing some derivatives in order to get the optimal value of alpha. So all of this requires a little, uh, some gradient evaluation and function evaluations. But of course, you get a much more accurate value of alpha k at which the function gets minimized. So there is always a trade-off between whether you want to use constant step size or you want to use step size pegged according to this rule. And there is no um, general method that I can tell you. You just have to pick it up based on your experience of whichever works, whichever gets to the optimal solution faster. Then there is the diminishing step size. And the idea in diminishing step size is you pick alpha k, which is greater than or greater than 0, such that summation of alpha k is equal to infinity and summation of alpha k square is less than infinity. So alpha k is going to 0. Summation of alpha k goes to infinity. And summation of alpha k square is finite. And one example is 1 over k, 1 over k 0 0.5 plus delta. Delta is a positive number. And so on. All of these diminishing step size satisfies summation infinity. Uh, summation of square is finite. And each of the terms is greater than 0. For deterministic optimization with very few errors, you can pretty much drop this assumption. You don't really need it. But in many cases, there are a lot of round off errors and some sort of errors that creeps in in your optimization problem. And if those errors are significant, pronounced, because of the hardware you are using or because of the way you are computing your gradient, uh, let's say you are using finite difference to compute the gradient. Then you are introducing sources of errors in co gradient computation. Then you also want to add this condition in alpha k so that even though alpha k is going to infinity, you don't want your summation of alpha k squared to also go to infinity. There is some very complicated mathematical reason why this should be the case when you have errors in your gradient computation. Uh, but I don't want to get into that mathematics here. It, it requires quite a bit of machinery to understand why this is useful. But it is much easier to understand why this is useful. Why do you think summation of alpha k should be infinity? Why can't it be a finite number? So what happens? Let's say I'm standing here, x0. This is my x0. I have a sequence of directions that I need to pick in order to get to the optimal point. And I'm picking alpha k in such a fashion that my summation of alpha k is equal to 1. OK, it's a finite number. What's the problem? In stop at some point. So I will stop at some point. OK, I won't be able to make much progress. And my optimal point may be much farther away from where I'm standing right now. So therefore, it makes sense to be able to reach any point in the space by picking a sequence of directions and picking an sequence of alpha k. So in order to explore the entire space, 
I want my summation of alpha k to be equal to infinity. Because if it is finite, I may just stop short of my optimal solution, which is going to be bad for me. So that's why I want my alpha k, sum of alpha k to be equal to infinity. <coughs> Okay. Now the next way of step size selection is called Armijo's rule. <coughs> so constant step size and diminishing step size are brainless step sizes. We don't have to apply our brain, just fix it and forget about it. The minimization and limited minimization rule, you still have to write a few more lines of code to solve that minimization problem to compute alpha k, which then you can use for the gradient descent step. <coughs> uh, there's another way to compute alpha k, which is known as Armijo's rule. And the idea is, I'm going to look at how I'm going to successively reduce the value of my step size by checking some conditions. Like if some conditions are met, I will pick alpha k according to that condition and I'll exit. Otherwise, I'll reduce the value of alpha k and check if the condition is met again. So here is the idea, my alpha k is equal to s beta raised to k. So s is greater than 0, beta is between 0 and 1, such that f of xk minus f of xk plus s beta raised to k dk is greater than or equal to minus sigma beta raised to k. Oh, uh, sorry, I shouldn't write alpha k. This is beta raised to m. Beta raised to m. It's not the same k. It's a different value. sigma is also greater than 0. Yes? What's the constraint on m? Yeah, so you have to pick the minimum m for which this condition holds. So you start with m equals to 0, and you check if this condition holds or not. Let's say for m equals to 0, it doesn't hold. Then you pick m equals to 1, check whether this condition holds or not. If it doesn't hold, you change the value of m, so increase m equals to 2, and check if this condition holds or not. And as soon as this condition holds for whatever value of m, you pick alpha k to be equal to s beta raised to m. Okay, So that's how you pick the step size at, at step k. Sorry? You do this again, okay? So for each step, uh, you have to do this maybe a few few times, maybe like two or three or four, maybe five times, in order to get the value of alpha k, and then you proceed further. What is the drawback of Armijo's rule? So this is something you need to compute only once. Okay, You have to compute it for gradient descent. You can just store it in the memory and use it. Right? Same thing with dk. You just have to compute it once and then store it in the memory. So, And this inner product is an easy, easy uh, matrix computation. 
not very complicated. So what is it that you have to do again and again in this, in this particular method for computing alpha k? Evaluate the second function. So evaluate this part, right? So this part is something that you need to evaluate at every value of m. When is function evaluations costly? Okay, so this problem has a drawback that when function evaluations are costly, then you cannot really use this, this rule. Um, so if you, have a very, if you have a billion dimensional space or a million dimensional space and you have to evaluate a complicated function over a million dimensional space, it's going to take several hours or minutes to be able to evaluate this function. And that creates a problem. Okay, so think about Google and Facebook and they have data all over the place and if they are running some analytics on all their customer data, they can't be running function evaluations every second because that's very costly. This data is all over the world and you can't really run, uh, do this function evaluation on data that is distributed geographically. So in those situations, Armijo's rule is not very feasible. So all in all, Constant step size and diminishing step sizes are most widely used step sizes because it's much easier. Uh, you, you, there is no complexity involved in computing alpha k. At least the alpha k part is easy. You, all the complexity is in computing dk in those problems. Okay, any question? There are examples in signal processing as well where function evaluations are very costly. Like if you're processing MRI data or something, which is a three-dimensional data of your brain or of your body, you can't really be doing a lot of function evaluations if you have to run some analytics on top of that data. So those are all situations where you can't really use Armijo's rule. And so people stick to constant step size or diminishing step size. You can, of course, come up with more fancy step size selection rules so you can write in your MATLAB iteration, for the first 10,000 iterations, keep a constant step size. After that, start diminishing the step size, okay? So that's also feasible. You can, uh, you can do that. Or you want to be a bit more fancy here, you can pick alpha k to be equal to beta zero over beta one plus k. So now you have two more parameters to choose from and you can speed up the computation for whatever optimization you're trying to solve. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Yes, please. Uh, when you said uh, uh, the gradient and dk is you compute it once, you mean you compute it once in this step? Correct. So next step you have to You have to do it again, of course, yeah. Yeah, in this case, there are two steps, right? K is one step and M is another step. So we are just talking about changing M here and not, not K. Any other question? Okay, so uh, I think it's, it's time now. So um, I'll just stop here. We'll talk about the convergence properties of gradient descent method. And we'll talk about some specialized gradient descent methods for, for problems, for some specialized problems in the subsequent classes. So have a great weekend, a long weekend, and we'll see you on Wednesday. If you have questions, oh, one announcement. So I have seen most of the people have completed the quizzes, but some people have still not completed the quizzes, so please complete it, the deadline is tonight. And if you're not getting notifications for all the assignments and quizzes that are uploaded to Carmen, please turn on your notification, okay? So as soon as I, Upload an assignment, you will get the notification immediately. Thank you.